Thank you very much. Okay, well, first I'd like to uh, thank you, Dr. Khan, as well as Shasta Regional Medical Center for the opportunity to um, uh, meet with you all today and share my um, one of my, my passions, which is um, lipid and diabetes management. And uh, great to be up here. I actually, um, I, I think, spoke at one of the other hospitals about 10 years or so ago, and I was first up in this area, I think, when I was five years old, when my family and I drove up to Oregon, where my mom went to college, so that was back in the 60s. So I go back a long ways. Um, these are my disclosures. I um, forgot to mention Asperian should also be listed here. So um, I, I just thought I'd share with you just a little bit about my background. I, I, um, I'm actually a native of Southern California, and I actually date my, um, my interest in preventive cardiology back to 1979 when I was a high school student and learned about the, um, the um, actually Pritikin program. Some of you may have heard of that and, and learned how an um, intensive lifestyle can lower your cholesterol, even control your diabetes, things like that. Then I did my bachelor's degree thesis in biochemistry on the LDL receptor and how um, this related to atherosclerosis, uh, the work of Brown and Goldstein, who then a few years later won the Nobel Prize. And uh, I did my um, PhD uh, with the Framingham Heart Study looking at um, uh, risk factors following myocardial infarction. And um, I've been fortunate to have edited a series of textbooks on preventive cardiology going back 20 years and managed to get my son since he was a baby and now 21 years old um, in front of those uh, books. So um, so we, we actually begin our story by talking about my actually mentor, Dr. Cano, who was probably the most famous director of the Framingham Heart Study. And in 1961, 60 years ago, incidentally the year that I was born, he coined the term risk factors, um, which really, you know, many of us feel uh, started the field of preventive cardiology. And he really pointed out um, in, in the Framingham Heart Study, as you know, is seminal in pointing out um, you know, many of the risk factors we take for granted and their importance in predicting cardiovascular disease, such as hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, cigarette smoking, for example. And he also pointed out, and looks like the text got a little bit garbled by the um, this conversion to the iPad, but what what's on the bottom really points out that um, he was one of the first who, to point out that um, risk functions should be used in assessing a person's risk of cardiovascular disease because that can then help tailor the intensity of treatment. And it wasn't until 20 years later that the ACC Bethesda conference then um, pointed out that intensity of treatment should be matched to a person's risk. So this is a very important concept when we talk about um, uh, risk factor management and preventive cardiology. Now, um, if we fast forward back to, um, you know, up to the present day, this is the current um, ASCVD risk estimator plus that everybody should have um, actually downloaded on your smartphone. It's available as an app, and you can um, punch in like your age, your cholesterol, your blood pressure, cigarette smoking status, et cetera, and estimate your 10-year risk of a hard atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease event, non-fatal MI, coronary heart disease, death, or stroke for people 40 to 79, and lifetime risk for ages 20 to 59. Several EMR systems, including EPIC, um, have now programmed this into their systems. But this is very important in primary prevention and 
is meant to be um, a starting point in assessing the person's risk. It's certainly not the end all as we're gonna talk about, but it's a starting point and importantly is an impetus for this all important um, shared decision making and patient provider discussion, which is a, a very big, um, it, you, you know, there's, there's great emphasis on this now in you know, really all areas of healthcare, including preventive cardiology. So discussing with the patient what their risks are, what, what it means, and how to lower their risk through lifestyle as well as um, evidence-based um, pharmacologic therapies that we're going to be talking about. Now, Dr. Kopeski um, is going, who is one of the best speakers on, um, on actually many topics of preventive cardiology, including lifestyle management. He'll be giving you a great talk on this. So this is the only slide I have, which really this points to the importance of um, this dietary pattern that emphasizes intake of um, veg fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low-fat dairy products, poultry, fish, legumes, non-tropical vegetable oils, nuts, and limits, intake of sweets and sugar-sweetened beverages, and physical activity. Um, the general recommendation is 150 minutes, uh, um, actually per week, um, uh, three days at least a moderate intensity physical activity or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity, and also including resistance training. So this is very important. You're gonna hear a lot more about this later from Dr. Kopeski. Now, when we use that risk calculator, remember this divides people into four key groups, okay? Low risk, less than 5% risk, for which lifestyle modification is gonna be um, sufficient for most of these people. Then borderline risk, intermediate risk, and high risk defined as 20% or greater risk of an event in 10 years. This is where you're going to need both a combination of lifestyle and pharmacologic therapy. But it's in this actually middle range, borderline and intermediate, where we need to consider this um, rather long list of risk enhancing factors to further inform the treatment decision. So this includes like a family history of premature ASCVD. And you know, and whenever I talk about this, I say how this should never be recorded in the record as a binary yes, no, okay? But it's the number of first degree relatives, male relatives under the age of 55 or female under the, age of 65 who had had some form of, of um, atherosclerosis or a cardiac event, okay? So, so keep that in mind. You need to do a complete family history. It's not a, this a simple yes, no, okay? And then obviously if you have elevated LDL cholesterol, metabolic syndrome, we've done a lot of work in this area over the last couple decades, um, you know, and, 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 um, and then, of course, chronic kidney disease is now considered a risk enhancing factor. Chronic inflammatory conditions show up in the guidelines also now as a risk enhancing factor, such as psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, or HIV and AIDS. Um, there are various female specific risk enhancing factors that have given. Been, been actually given attention in the most recent guidelines, such as premature menopause and pregnancy-related conditions, such as preeclampsia and perhaps gestational diabetes as well. High-risk ethnic groups, okay, and South Asians as well as others are identified as being at uniquely higher risk, and that should be considered as well. And certain lipid biomarkers, elevated C-reactive protein, if you have that information. We're going to talk about lipoprotein little a and also increases in apple lipoprotein B, um, you know, so, so this would be essentially non-HDL cholesterol includes all the apple lipoprotein B measures. Um, and then also ankle breakout index, which remember is a measure of 
peripheral arterial disease. So if it's less than 0.9, that's diagnostic of peripheral arterial disease. Whoops. Okay, so, um, but then if, you know, if you need further information, a coronary calcium score can be very useful. And this has been a, um, a topic of, uh, of great research interest to me. I was um, um, one of the pioneers, you know, along with Matt Budoff, who has spoken here before, has done a lot of great work in this area. And, um, and, and what this has now, for the first time, been incorporated in the guidelines as of 2018, pointing out that um, if you have a calcium score of zero, this is below the threshold of therapy. We know a calcium score of zero confers a long-term warranty against cardiovascular events. So you could actually consider postponing or avoiding drug therapy. Now, there are certain exceptions, so we don't want you to do this if somebody has diabetes, if they're a current heavy cigarette smoking or strong family history of ASCVD, or if they have, for example, familial hypercholesterolemia, we don't want you to um, withhold a statin, certainly. Um, if, if the score is above 100 or greater than the 75th percentile for actually age and sex, then this is above the um, threshold of benefits. So the person should definitely be on probably a high intensity statin, which remember is designed to lower the LDL cholesterol by at least 50%. If they're in between though, you could consider, um, uh, you know, um, you know, you, you, you can discuss with the patient, you could maybe postpone statin therapy or, you know, start it now. So um, there's a little bit of gray area there. Now these are data that uh, Matt Budoff published. I was involved in uh, this, this project as well. And it basically shows that if your calcium score is 100 or greater, this is this actually gray, uh, the, um, the actually second highest line, that regardless of ethnic group, you're above that 7.5% threshold where there is a net clinical benefit for considering statin therapy. And conversely, if your score is zero, you're far below that benefit and you have a really long um, lifetime risk uh, of, of not developing a coronary event. So that's very important. Now this um, slide actually got a little bit messed up, but this was a study that um, actually my associate, Dr. Malik, and I did about 10 years ago. And what this shows, and, and unfortunately the graph got messed up, but what it shows is that in people with diabetes, okay, we can't consider them all high risk equivalents. They too have a great heterogeneity in risk, and the calcium score is a very effective way of stratifying risk in people with diabetes. And we found that people who had a zero calcium score have only a 0.4% per year risk of developing coronary heart disease, but it's tenfold greater if they have a calcium score of 400 or greater. So this, and there, there have been guidelines that suggest that people with diabetes should, you could consider a calcium score to stratify risk and decide how, how aggressively they could, could be treated um, as shown at the bottom here. Okay, so we've discussed how um, we have four different buckets of risk, low, borderline, intermediate, and high, right? High risk means you definitely should be on therapy and lifestyle. Low risk, the focus is on lifestyle. People with diabetes at least should be on a moderate intensity statin if they have multiple risk factors or they're greater than 20% risk than a high intensity statin. Um, also people with suspected familial hypercholesterolemia, so an LDL of 190 or higher, okay, they're gonna be at increased, substantially increased risk and if they have um, the, the, the specific genetic condition of FH, they're gonna be at even 
higher risk because of their lifetime risk of very high cholesterol. And then we talked about how the, the use of the risk enhancing factors to inform the treatment decision for the borderline and intermediate risk, as well as the coronary calcium score that can be further be very, very helpful. So remember, a high intensity statin is designed to lower the LDL at least 50%, okay? But um, this is, of course, does not occur in everybody, okay? There are always, um, there's a wide range of response. And while, you know, on average, that's true, you can imagine there are a number of people that don't get that 50% response. And we're going to talk about other non-statin therapies in a few minutes that can further, further aid your efforts to lower LDL. Uh, modern intensity statins are designed to lower LDL 30 to 50%. Now, secondary prevention, okay, so people with established ASCVD, what's new is that we don't put them all in the same bucket like we used to, okay? Now, we define people to be at um, very high risk or not at very high risk. And in a minute, I'll show you how you distinguish that. But the very high risk people, um, well, let me start by saying that those defined to be not at very high risk. The idea is they should still be on a high intensity statin, and if the LDL still remains above 70, then to consider ezetimibe to further reduce that LDL, okay? And, and ezetimibe is generic, so it's inexpensive. The very high risk people, similar pathway, also considering ezetimibe if the LDL is 70 or higher, but um, to then consider a PCSK9 if you still need additional LDL lowering beyond that, okay? So that's the distinction in treatment. Now, how we define very high risk is that you need to have two or more of these major events, so a recent ACS, history of MI, history of ischemic stroke, or symptomatic peripheral arterial disease, and then two or more of these high-risk conditions listed, okay, such as advanced age, heterozygous FH, um, prior bypass surgery, PCI, diabetes, hypertension, CKD, cigarette smoking, persistently elevated LDL, or a history of heart failure, okay, so two or more um, major events or one of those and two or more of the high-risk conditions. Now, why is this important? So various papers, including um, this one published a couple years ago in Jack, shows that um, compared to those not at very high risk in red, you can see their, um, their, their event rate is about 17 per thousand, um, thousand person years, but it's three times greater if you're very high risk, and if you're that subgroup that has two or more major ASCV conditions, it's actually five times higher than those not at very high risk. So again, we have, you know, we can show the importance of even stratifying within the people with ASCVD, okay? Now, um, despite um, Numerous primary and secondary prevention statin trials done over the past several several decades. Um, when I first started um, working at UCI, lovastatin had first came out, right? That was the very first statin that was a game changer. But despite all these statins, you see they, you know, they, they actually overall lower risk 20 to 30 percent, but Many people um, are still suffering events despite being in the statin group, okay? So this is a, um, led to the concept of residual risk. Now, you can also talk about residual risk from other preventive therapies. You know, it doesn't just apply to statins, but it's, it's, it's been, you know, kind of in the limelight in particular in referring to um, residual risk remain and after standard of care therapies like statins. So then, you know, there's been 
a lot of attention into, you know, what other therapies could be used to eat away at this residual risk. So, so ezetimibe was um, combined with simvastatin in the Improve It trial in people who had an acute coronary syndrome within 10 days. Okay, so a very specific group of people with a very recent event. Okay, doesn't necessarily apply to people with stable ASCVD where they had their event many years ago, but very high risk people within 10 days. And they did show over seven years a statistically significant reduction, but that reduction, that relative risk reduction was only 6%. But it was significant because of the large number of people enrolled and the absolute event rates were 2% different that does translate to a number needed to treat of 50. So, um, so, so hence, it, it has become a recommended therapy in secondary prevention to further lower the LDL because we have the data that shows it will lower cardiovascular events. But one of the greatest advancements of the last decade was the development and the availability of the PCS King 9 monoclonal antibody therapy. So remember, PCS King 9 is a protease of about 700 amino acids, and, and, and that's highlighted in pink there. And it will usually actually cause destruction of the LDL particle and receptor complex resulted in fewer LDL receptors causing the cholesterol to, to actually increase. But if you have a monoclonal antibody, you can see it binds to that. And then this LDL particle association with the LDL receptor and the recycling of the LDL, that process can go, continues to go on happily ever after, okay? And, and then you, the, the, the lipid levels are controlled. So studies, I, you know, there's many studies that have shown, shown the efficacy. In general, you get about 60% further LDL cholesterol reduction beyond a statin. So never before have we seen such low LDL cholesterol levels in the Fourier outcomes trial, and I'm showing you the efficacy data from this trial, but it's similar in many of the others. Um, the, the median LDL got down to about 30 milligram per deciliter, the lowest that had ever been seen in any major trial. And, and this was also the first um, cardiovascular outcomes trial of a PCS King 9, showing that there, on top of statin therapy, you now saw an additional 15% relative risk reduction, that's the hazard ratio of 0.85 um, in the people that were on evolucumab. So, so here was another therapy that further addressed this residual risk concept. Interestingly, some patients got their LDLs down as low as below 10 milligram per deciliter. Can you imagine that? 504 people got to below 10 and and, and this slide just shows that at least over the duration of the trial, now that did result in further risk reduction. There was a 40% risk reduction compared to those who still stayed above 100. But it also showed that even these people who got to below 10, there was demonstrated safety. Now, of course, we don't know 10 years out because we don't have that experience yet, but at least for the duration that we have the safety and efficacy trial from the uh, data from the PCS King 9s we do see safety now going out to four or five years, even in those that get to um, pretty low levels below 30. Um, the higher risk people benefit more, okay? So this is, this supports um, what I just pointed out in the guidelines, right? Remember that the very high-risk people are the ones who, 
who would be candidates for these therapies. So if you've had multiple myocardial infarctions, you can see that there's further benefit than if you have one prior MI. Also, and I don't have a slide on this, but if, if, if you've had an MI within the past year, okay, you're going to benefit more than if you've had an MI further out. Multivessel disease, people with multivessel disease derive greater benefit than those um, without um, multivessel disease, okay? Um, and then the other outcomes trial, Odyssey outcomes involving the other PCS King Ion on the market, which is Alarakamov, showed a similar benefit. This trial differed from Fourier in that it included people who had um, an acute coronary syndrome within the past year, okay? So a higher risk population than the Fourier people that um, were, were mainly um, uh, um, stable ASCVD. Okay, so that brings us to the point about triglycerides. So there's a fair amount of data now emerging that show that even um, triglycerides uh, below 100, um, uh, you, you know, you see this rise in risk below 100, okay? So, um, so uh, the ideal triglyceride level may be well below 100, um, and, and we used to think we were fine if we were below 150, but you can see that the risk seems to be rising dramatically even around 100. So, so unfortunately, though, most of the trials that have targeted triglycerides as well as HDL, um, and I'm not going to go into any great detail. One's involving fibrate therapy um, added to statins. One's involving niacin added to statins have not shown a benefit. So we've been very disappointed, um, you know, with the... Um, with, with the negative results of these trials. We were almost certain that raising HDL from niacin was going to benefit, but it did not. And in fact, there were even some significant side effects seen with um, niacin therapy in the HPS2 Thrive study. But there has been a revolution of trials involving omega-3 fatty acid supplementations, primarily seafood-derived omega-3 fatty acids. And some of these have involved dietary supplements. Some of these have involved combinations of EPA and DHA. And a few have involved pure EPA, the ones with pure EPA, the JELUS trial, and reduce it down here I'm going to spend some time talking about, are the only ones to show cardiovascular benefit. And the JELUS trial was done in Japan, and um, this showed, um, uh, this was involved pure EPA, and it did show a 20% overall reduction in the composite outcome in people with high triglycerides and low HDL, an even greater benefit of 53% in terms of cardiovascular event reduction. But this trial was done in Japan. People in Japan have much higher EPA levels than people in the United States and Europe. So there was really a need to do a trial that would much better represent the, the, the diversity of the populations in the United States and, and Europe. So Reduce It was, um, was done, and this, um, in addition to the PCS K9 trials, I would say this was the other great advance in uh, preventive cardiology in the past decade. And um, this trial was released in late 2018, interestingly, um, the same day that the new guidelines came out. So it wasn't incorporated into the new guidelines. But this involved people with established cardiovascular disease or diabetes and multiple risk factors, and they had to have um, increased triglyceride levels of, 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 it could be as low as 135, they were allowed 10% variability from the um, 150, and it had to be on statin therapy. So remember, whenever we're testing something new, we have to be 
it has to be on top of the standard of care, okay? Whether it be a new lipid agent, it's got to be on top of statins. If it's a diabetes agent, it's got to be on standard of care, on top of standard of care diabetes therapy. And the bottom line was a striking 25% risk reduction with many, many zeros before the one in the p-value and the number needed to treat of 21. Seldom have we seen in cardiovascular medicine such a dramatic benefit that you would just have to treat 21 people in order to prevent a cardiovascular event. And even more striking was the consistency in the secondary endpoints. Um, so in fatal and non-fatal MI, cardiovascular death, urgent or emergency revascularization, unstable angina, all of these were dramatically reduced and highly significant. Only total mortality didn't quite make it in the overall trial, but it did in the reduce it USA um, subpopulation. Um, and this is a great therapy to prevent the need for PCI or cabbage. Look at this dramatic reduction of um, 32% to in reducing the risk of needing PCI or 39% in reducing the need for cabbage. So a very important therapy to prevent and, and ultimately reduce the significant healthcare costs that you know um, go along with these procedures. Um, my close colleague Matt Budoff, who's presented at this meeting before, um, published the Evaporate trial um, late last year. And, and this was very important because th this, um, you, so it utilized coronary CT angiography at baseline and after eight, 18 months, 80 patients randomized double blind. They were put on pure, pure icosapent ethyl EPA therapy. And one can see that the primary endpoint of low attenuation plaque, while it went up dramatically in the placebo group, it was reduced in the icosapent ethyl group in blue. So were most of these other endpoints, such as fibro fatty um, lesions, um, fibrous lesions, non-calcified and total um, calcified plaques were also, total plaque was also significantly reduced. So this shows the potential of this therapy and even reversing atherosclerosis, okay? And we've seen certainly um, with Steve Nissen's intravascular ultrasound studies um, that high intensity statins, such as from the Meteor study, can also um, potentially reverse atherosclerosis. So um, what we, so in, uh, so in December of 2019, this became the um, first drug to be approved by the FDA um, as an adjunct to maximally tolerated uh, statin therapy to reduce cardiovascular events in people who had elevated triglycerides and either established ASCVD or diabetes. Since then, there's been numerous organizations. The American Diabetes Association was the first to endorse um, the use of this and their higher risk people with diabetes and numerous other organizations around the world have also pointed out that, that this can be considered for our ASCVD patients or multiple risk factor diabetes patients with um, triglycerides of 135 to 499. There are numerous potential beneficial effects of EPA in terms of um, improving endothelial function, nitric oxide bio bioavailability, improving characteristics of the unstable plaque even, and decreasing um, uh, things such as oxidized LDL, uh, remnant lipoproteins, and, and decreasing cholesterol crystalline domain, domains as well as inflammatory factors and 
and features of an unstable plaque, um, EPA has been shown to decrease. So numerous different mechanisms. Um, important that healthcare providers and patients alike understand that this is the only um, evidence-based therapy to um, reduce ASCVD as far as fish oil therapies go. We don't have evidence from any of the dietary supplement fish oils, which remember are not regulated by the FDA, um, so they can't really be recommended to treat diseases, even though many people um, uh, consume them and certain benefits have been claimed for different um, improvements in health. But the fact of the matter is, is like in this lead-in uh, dietary supplement um, fish oil, um, look at the saturated fat. It was um, consisted of more than a third saturated fat. So why on earth would you want to give your patients or recommend something that contained large amounts of saturated fat? And then many times they are already oxidized. Okay, so we, we have to be very, very careful. And again, you know, cardiology is, is based on evidence-based therapies remember where we have clinical trial evidence. So the new paradigm is, is really focused. We have, of course, an LDL lowering pathway we've discussed. We're going to talk about a few even newer agents, but ezetimibe followed by a PCS king 9 in, in our very high-risk people. And the triglyceride-related pathway doesn't have to be independent of this, okay? But icosapent ethyl... Um, from reduce it, of course, has been indicated for people with stable ASCVD or people with multiple risk factors. Um, many of us believe that um, people, even with normal triglycerides, would probably benefit from this therapy because we see similar benefits regardless of whether the um, on-treatment triglycerides are above 150 or below 150, but unfortunately the trial only went down to 135, so we don't um, definitively have that data. Now, um, very new since the pandemic um, started um, is the approval of a newer LDL lowering therapy called Bampadoic acid, okay? This acts in the same pathway as a statin does, okay? Remember, a statin inhibits the enzyme HMG-CoA reductase. Bampadoic acid inhibits an enzyme called ATP citrate lyase, just two levels above. It's not present in the skeletal muscle, which may be a reason why you don't get the um, um, problems with um, actually myositis that um, are seen in some people on statins. Uh, and it, it does, um, so both bampadoic acid and the combination of bampadoic acid and azetamide were approved just over a year ago by the FDA. As monotherapy, it reduces LDL about 15%. Um, in combination with azetamide, you get about a 36% reduction in LDL. Important to understand, though, is that unlike statins or PCS king ions or even azetamide alone, we do not have um, outcome data yet. So that is pending. The clear outcomes trial um, ongoing will hopefully answer whether the LDL reduction you're getting from bempadoic acid will provide incremental reduction in cardiovascular events, but we're still awaiting that data. What I think is one of the most exciting developments currently is, is the, um, and, and, and hopefully soon to be approved by the FDA, it's pending, is a drug called Inquisiron. This is a small interferon double-stranded um, double -stranded RNA, and and the idea is that it inhibits the production of PCSK9. Okay, so it's in, in, instead of um, binding to the PCSK9, preventing its action, you're actually um, acting on the, 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 the um, RNA to 
prevent its production from the beginning. And what's exciting about this is that an injection at baseline, three months and every six months after, provides a time average reduction in LDL cholesterol by about, by over 50%. So this may be the closest thing, if you want to call it, um, some of us like to think of this as the closest thing maybe to a vaccine for atherosclerosis, assuming that it provides further cardiovascular event reduction. So that remains to be seen. The long-term outcomes trial is in progress to see whether this mechanism for interrupting the PCSK9, it, it, like the monoclonal antibody therapy, is going to provide a further reduction in events. So we have to wait to see that. Lipoprotein little a is, has recently become, um, be, um, come on the radar screen for, for many of us in the prevention field. Uh, some of us were studying it a long time ago, but it, it's recently drawn a lot of attention. This is an LDL particle with an apple lipoprotein A attached to it, and it, it, it has many um, pro-inflammatory, pro-atherogenic, and pro-thrombotic properties. I'm not going to go through all of those. But importantly, you have to understand that this may be one of the most common genetic disorders. So remember, heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia is present in about 1 in 250 people. But, but depending on what cut point you use, um, uh, widely quoted as the cut point of 60 or 70 milligram per deciliter, and this is affecting 20% of the population have this genetically elevated lipoprotein little a, which is, um, translates to a lot of people in the United States. And our current guidelines recommend its measurement in people with ASCVD. The European guidelines recommend its measurement in everybody because this is genetically determined and, and determined at birth. Um, you can see that um, that, uh, for example, 10% have levels of 90 or higher. And there's evidence from meta-analysis, Mendelian randomization, as well as genome-wide association studies that, that demonstrate it to be a causative factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, we recently studied this and um, looked at specific cut points in the AIM high cohort, which were statin-treated people, and you can see that, for example, almost an 80% greater risk in people with levels of um, 70 or higher um, compared to below 15. That was for first events. For total events, it was about 50% higher. There are newer therapies, such as this antisense oligonucleotide, um, currently um, currently in development. There's a large outcomes trial being done, but the, um, the initial data is very promising, showing up to an 80% reduction in lipoprotein A. This is the outcome study called Horizon. Um, we hope to be one of the participants in that. It's being done around the world and is enrolling people with elevated LPA levels who have had prior cardiovascular disease and treating them for four and a half years, um, obviously with this newer therapy on top of uh, statin. Also, um, a second one is in development, which is a RNA silencing therapy. Um, and uh, there's very preliminary data only on this yet, but it is also showing significant, um, significant reductions. Whoops, okay, let's see, I, I got, I pressed the wrong thing, so I need somebody to help me go back here. Okay, there's these messages that keep pop, 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 popping up, so, okay, 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 great, thank you. Um, okay, okay, yeah. Okay, so, um, so we've covered very nicely how um, the, Okay, somehow I'm, 
slide. Okay, so we've discussed how the um, new cholesterol guidelines um, retain the, you know, similar statin eligible groups that were discussed in the 2013 guidelines, but now we're using these risk enhancing factors and coronary calcium, right, to further inform the treatment decision. We talked about the distinction between high risk and very high risk ASCVD and the role that um, some emerging and recently um, recently available non-statin therapies may have in addressing this um, residual risk. Now, um, luckily Dr. Wright has made my job easy to talk about the diabetes uh, stuff. He's pointed out that, um, now let's see, that's not switching. Okay, so he pointed out um, actually earlier that it's really cardiovascular disease that is going to be the leading cause of death. So coronary heart disease, stroke, heart failure, peripheral arterial disease, these are all the major causes of death in people with diabetes. And we have to make sure we and our patients understand that diabetes is far more than a blood sugar problem, okay? We have to change the mindset and they need to think of this as a cardiovascular problem. And data that we recently published from the ACC Diabetes Collaborative Registry among almost 75,000 adults shows that we're doing a fair job about 50 to 70% in, in, in seeing um, control of A1C, blood pressure, or LDL, 85% non-smoking, but only 25% were at target for all three, and 15% if you use the recent blood pressure target. Remember, this was lowered in 2017 to less than 130 over 80. Only 15%. So we have the most advanced medicines of anywhere in the world, but why are only 15% of our people with diabetes at target for the three big things that we have to think of, right? Not only the blood sugar, but the blood pressure and the LDL cholesterol in particular. So we gotta, you know, some people are paying attention to one, but not others. So we gotta get people thinking of, they gotta make sure all these three things are at target. We've also published data in, um, from the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis showing that if you're at target for all three of those, LDL, blood pressure, and A1C, that your risk of future cardiovascular events are 60% lower than if you're not at target for any of those, okay? The Steno-2 clinical trial showed that intensive multifactorial risk factor reduction also reduced events by about 50%. So we really have to get all these things controlled and composite. Um, we have to think about the ABCs for reducing complications from diabetes. Certainly there's blood pressure and lipid control, um, very important, and we talked a lot about lipid control today already. In terms of glycemic control, we need to be more, um, um, we can be more stringent than the typical target of 7% if the risk for hypoglycemia is low, disease duration is um, short, life expectancy is long, uh, and we're free of comorbidities, have a good support system, but if it's the opposite, then we need to be less stringent. And, for people with multiple comorbidities, um, a less stringent target has been indicated. Dr. Wright nicely talked about the SGLT2 inhibitors. Remember, these promote urinary glucose excretion. We also have dapagliflozin 2. The GLP-1 receptor agonists are also um, the other big new kid on the block over the last five years that show improvements in cardiovascular um, risk, and, and they uh, stimulate insulin release and inhibit glucagon release and, and lower um, blood glucose. But both of these, remember, as um, pointed out earlier, are much more than 
glucose lowering agents. Now, the current guidelines, it's important that you recognize that initiation of these can be considered independent of the current A1C or the A1C target. Okay, this is very important because we're used to titrate and diabetes therapy based on the A1C, but both of these agents have cardiovascular risk reducing benefits. So we need to think about giving these for that reason, not for the um, reducing A1C. They modestly reduce A1C, but they, the more important, they have cardiovascular benefits. And you could replace something like a, um, you know, like a worthless sulfonylurea with, 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 with um, actually one of these, for example. Um, and the ACC has a consensus pathway. I'll, I'm not going to read through all this, but I would refer you to this because it nicely discusses the need for these therapies in our higher risk patients. Um, in addition to gui optimal guideline directed therapy, there's many indications and contraindications for each. Um, for a GLP-1, if your goal is substantial weight loss, and there are now trials that are um, investigating the uh, potentially very powerful weight loss benefits of these, and that may be of particular interest. Obviously, for heart failure um, risk reduction, you're going to want an SGLT2. And if you have um, significant CKD, uh, these are, of course, contraindicated for um, SGLT2s. Dr. Wright nicely talked about the MFA-REG study. Again, substantial reductions even in cardiovascular death, all-cause mortality, and heart failure hospitalization. The CANVAS trial also met its primary endpoint involving canagliflozin and important reductions in heart failure. Credence taught us that these drugs, the SGLT2s, are also going to be the next greatest drugs for chronic kidney disease, as Dr. Wright pointed out early. And look at earlier, and look at this 30% risk reduction of the primary outcome of developing end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine reno, or cardiovascular death from canagliflozin in people who had diabetes and CKD. The DECLARE study also showed benefits in cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. It was bo somewhat borderline for MACE, however. And DAPA-HF was pointed out as the first heart failure trial specifically in heart failure patients with or without diabetes to demonstrate benefit, in this case from dapa -Glifos. And these were in people, though, with um, reduced ejection fraction heart failure. So there are trials underway. Um, as some will be out soon in the next year for people with um, preserved EF heart failure. Emperor um, also showed um, uh, reductions in heart failure um, involving M amphoglyphosin and reduced EF people. So important. And then finally, just a few slides on the SGLT2s as we close up here. Um, a 13% reduction involving liriglutide. Um, this was a mixture of both people with and without ASCVD, all who had diabetes though. Sustained 6 similarly um, showed benefit of semaglutide. Important, we recognize semaglutide. So the, the GLP-1s have generally been injectable therapies, but now semaglutide is available as an oral therapy. So that may be um, more palatable for some people. And sustained 6 showed a 24% reduction in the primary outcome and almost a 40% reduction in stroke. So the GLP-1s are felt by some to be more having an anti-atherosclerotic benefit, whereas the SGLT-2s have other benefits that may be more hemodynamic. And lastly, this emphasizing the value of the cardiodiabetes care team and involves 
um, a wide range of specialists. The, the registered dietitians, I always point out, need to be better integrated into the healthcare system because they're a crucial member and there's not enough of them around to ensure um, um, adequate um, adherence to lifestyle. So key takeaways, we've talked about diabetes. Um, most people are suboptimally treated for these multiple risk factors and diabetes has a wide range of risk. We've talked about the usefulness of screening for subclinical atherosclerosis like coronary calcium and then finally, we've talked about the evidence base around some of the newer therapies to um, reduce risk. So with that, um, th thank you very much for your attention. Um, uh, you, you can learn a lot more and read up in our American Journal of Preventive Cardiology. I'm the co-editor-in-chief of that with Aaron Mickles from Johns Hopkins and a new textbook um, if you want to learn even more. So thank you again for your attention. <laughs>